Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Mary and Greg and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We just wish you all a blessed Sabbath. Now, we're pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Greg, will you, will you invoke God's presence and God's blessings on this morning's study? It would be my pleasure. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this beautiful Sabbath morning. And Lord, we ask and pray that you please send your Holy Spirit to be with us. Amen. To speak through us, Lord, let every word that proceeds out of our mouths be inspired from you through your Holy Spirit. Amen. And may they touch the ears of those who are listening, Lord. There's a lot of principles that we're going to go over today. Yes. And we need your help, your guidance, and your direction, and your conviction, Lord. Help us to understand what it is that you're teaching us and to apply it in our lives and to lovingly share it with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you. Sure. This quarter's lessons, uh, as you have uh, uh, become accustomed to it, invites us to come and find rest in Christ. Resting in Christ is the key to the type of life that Jesus promised his followers. And you and I are professed followers of Christ. Jesus tell us, tells us in John chapter 10, verses 10, that the thief does not come except to steal and kill and to destroy, but that you, Lord, have come, that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. What a verse. Amen. Rest in Christ connects us to salvation. It connects us to grace, to creation, to the Sabbath, to our understanding of the state of the dead and the soon coming of Jesus and to so, so much more. This is why Christ appeals to us as we read in Matthew chapter 11, Matthew 11 verses 28 to 30, Christ tells us, come to me, O who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This week's Sabbath school lesson is about a Sabbath rest, in a sense, a continuation of last week's lesson. The memory test, text, text, text the key text is found in Leviticus chapter uh, 23 and verses 3. Leviticus 23, 3. And Moses writes this incredible statement where he says, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in your dwelling." That's an incredible verse. And I want to just spend a couple of minutes on that. You know, there's really two statements here. First is that uh, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is Sabbath of solemn rest and holy conv convocation. If you really read the statement in Hebrew, it literally tells you this is a Sabbath of Sabbath observance. The original Hebrew description encompasses the following meaning. This is a, a Sabbath of deep rest. Rest is fundamental to the Sabbath. It is a Sabbath of complete rest. There is a lot of parts to rest that we need to understand. And we're going to touch that on, on, okay. on, on this week's lesson. And it says it's a perfect Sabbath. Mm. So it's a perfect Sabbath. You know, in Mark chapter 2, verses 27, Mark 2, 27, um, the, the, uh, the apostle tells us that the seventh day Sabbath was made for man. This was God's gift to his children. God gave us the Sabbath so we could enjoy it perpetually. The seventh day Sabbath is incorporated in the law of God, the Ten Commandments. You're going to hear it. Um, you know, this morning, and uh, which, which is God's constitution for this world. As such, Sabbath observance becomes an obligation. 
for all human beings forever. Because the Sabbath was made before sin entered the world, it will remain after sin is no more. And thus we read in Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 and 23, Isaiah 66, 22 and 23, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, that all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. The day Amen. of rest, the Sabbath, is perpetual. Amen. And I'm looking forward to that. But that particular verse, verse 3 of uh, Leviticus 23, also has a very profound statement. It says that it is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwelling. So it is the Lord's Sabbath, and it indicates proprietorship. God owns it. To make sure that the Sabbath would not be considered a Jewish institution, Christ emphatically declared, as we read in Mark, 20, uh, Mark chapter 2, verses 27, that the Sabbath was made for man. But our Lord, the next verse, Mark 2, 28, adds, Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. He made it. So the Sabbath belongs to Christ. He is Lord of it. And therefore, no one should tamper with it, for they have no right to do so. Amen. It is his holy day, as he states in Isaiah chapter 58, 13. Amen. A brief overview of this week's Sabbath school lesson. And I'm going to ask you this question. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever lost something which was in plain sight, but you did not see it? Let's suppose you lost your car keys. You search all over the house, but could not find it. And suddenly you remembered. You remembered that you left the keys in your jet pocket hanging in the closet. You know, God has given us the gift of remembering. What if we did not have that gift? Mm. What if the only thing we knew was the present? Mm. I can tell you that life would be terribly complicated. As the title of our Sabbath school uh, lesson and of course the memory verse indicate, in this week's lesson we will return to the subject of the Sabbath and look at it from a, a different perspective. You will recall that the fourth commandment begins with the word remember. None of the other commandments begins that way. Remembering presupposes that we have knowledge, that we have known something before. The Sabbath commandment is a perpetual reminder to the entire world of God's creative authority. Wherever we are in the world, whether we recognize it or not, the Sabbath comes to all humanity offering its blessings each seventh day. You see, through Scripture, the Sabbath reminds us that Christ made it, that He redeemed it, He redeemed us, that He delivers us, that He recreates us, and that He is coming again for us. Amen. Our Sabbath school lesson this week underscores the fact that in God's eternal plan, the Sabbath is a day of blessing. It is a day of delight. It is a day of worship and a day of service. Especially in the Sabbath, as we linger, as we take time to be in God's presence, as we participate in cooperative or, or corporate worship, and as we seek him anew as we come to Christ for his indwelling God recreates us in his image Amen. let's now review this week's lesson and look more at the rest God has given us in the Sabbath commandment and why it it is important so Mary of all the Ten Commandments the Sabbath commandment begins with the word remember why is this important? Ah, this is very important. We're going to continue proceeding in our study of rest and how it relates to Sabbath and creation. 
Now, many people don't comprehend that there's a connection actually between Sabbath and creation. They believe Sabbath was given to the Jewish people or the Israelites at Mount Sinai, as we've said before, and they think that's where it began. Is that truly what the Bible teaches? Of all the Ten Commandments, as Victor pointed out, only the fourth one begins with the word remember. There is no remember to honor your father or mother or remember thou shalt not kill. The idea of remembering presupposes history. It presupposes that something happened in the past that we need to remember. When we remember, we make connections with the past. The fourth commandment begins with remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God is telling us to make that connection with the past, to go back in history to where the first set up, where he first set up Sabbath. And that was at creation. Last week we studied Genesis 2, and in verses 2 and 4, God's word says, And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. These verses don't contain the word Sabbath, but the concept is clearly implied. God states the seventh day three times, and he rested two times, and that he blessed and sanctified it. All of these are associated with the Sabbath in other Bible verses. Sabbath is intended to remind us of creation and of our special relation to God and to the rest of creation. Now, why do I say that? Let's read Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. Then we'll look at Genesis 9 and 6. And lastly, at Genesis 2 and 7, we're going to discover some fascinating features of creation. On Sabbath, as we reflect upon our creation, what's our special relation to God? Genesis 1, 26 to 27 states, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In Genesis 9, 6, God reiterates to Noah, for in the image of God, he made man. Our special relation to God is that we're created in his image, according to his likeness. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 45, it says, Here is clearly set forth the origin of the human race, and the divine record is so plainly stated that there is no occasion for erroneous conclusions. Here is no mystery. The genealogy of our race, as given by inspiration, traces back its origin, not to a line of developing germs, mollusks, and quadrupeds, but to the great creator. Though formed from the dust, Adam was the son of God. Man was to bear God's image, both in outward resemblance and in character. His nature was in harmony with the will of God. He was holy and happy in bearing the image of God and in perfect obedience to his will. So as we rest on Sabbath and reflect upon our creation, in what other way were we created differently than the rest of creation? Let's read Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God took a hands-on approach with us. He formed Adam with his hands, and he breathed life into his nostrils. With the remainder of creation, God spoke things into existence. As you read in Genesis 1, repeatedly it states, And God said, And with each of those phrases, he creates an element of this earth. 
However, with man, he goes one step further and gets up close and personal. Thirdly, our, on Sabbath, as we reflect upon our creation, how radically different is our position as humanity to the rest of God's creation? Let's read Genesis 2, verses 15 and 19 for that answer. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So we were also given dominion or stewardship over all the earth, air, land, sea, and its creatures. This defines our relationship with the rest of creation. This stewardship aspect is reiterated in Psalm 8, 6 to 8. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. We were placed as God's representatives here and to rule as his regents. We're to govern the natural world as God would. We have a responsibility towards creation. God said we are to have dominion over it. This doesn't mean exploiting it for our benefit. In conclusion, when we take time to rest with God on his holy Sabbath, let's meditate on the fact that God is reminding us of our history of creation. We were made in his image, formed by his own hands, and set apart to have dominion over creation. God set aside every seventh day to stop our daily common interests to rest and spend quality time with him. The Sabbath, ever pointing to him who made them all, bids men open the great book of nature and trace therein the wisdom, the power, and the love of the creator. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mary. Well, it is so wonderful, isn't it? Amen. For us to have a wonderful God that says, you know, I, I want to meet with you once a week so that we can fellowship Amen. and remember what it was like to create you, to recreate you, Amen. and to create everything around you. It's Amen. just wonderful. Amen. Amen. Greg, Monday's lesson tells us that the Sabbath is a celebration of freedom. Yes. Explain it, that to us. I will. Thank you. And good morning to each of you. And if you'll open your Bibles and join us, or you can also follow on your screen. But Monday's lesson, as Victor had mentioned, is titled Celebrating Freedom. So let's read Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 to 15. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commands you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well with you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. As we go through this lesson, you're going to see that we will be repeating some of the same verses. And the Lord uses this throughout Scripture. It's like a repeat and enlarge. Amen. And it's to bring about and strengthen certain principles and points. Amen. So as we go through this, just keep in mind you're going to think, oh, I heard that before. Good. That means you're remembering what exactly the Lord wants to share with us. Mm -hmm. And I know Danielle mentioned last week in the lesson, I really appreciated that, that she explained how Moses in Deuteronomy was really addressing the Israelites be because they were about to go into the promised land right. and Moses was not going to go with them. Right. And keep in mind they had been in the desert for 40 years and they were learning about God and learning about his ways. And Moses was, was really, he was really passionate right. about reminding them 
to not stray away from the Lord and what he had taught them. So Moses uses the word commands to emphatically express to them the importance of keeping the Sabbath because it's a sign to them that God redeemed them with an outstretched arm from the bondages of slavery and sin from Egypt. So God saved the Israelites with an outstretched arm, and God is offering his outstretched arm to each of us from sin today. That's what he's doing. He invites us to escape the sinful world in which we live today and the sins we may be in slavery to throughout the week by reconnecting with him on the Sabbath. If you think about that, what a wonderful creator we have to set aside a special time each week. And it's so special that it's the only day of the week, as we have heard earlier, it's the only day of the week that God blessed and sanctified to spend special time with him and to be in fellowship with him. It's a special day of the week that God provides for all of humanity to celebrate with him. The freedom from our daily toils at work and again from the bondages of this world that try to ensnare us and he invites us to rest in him. What a wonderful, loving God Amen. we serve. Amen. And as we each know, we all struggle with different things throughout the week. The bondages that we face on a daily basis. What bondage is that? It's sin. Mm-hmm. It's sin. Let's look at Genesis 4, verse 7. Mm-hmm. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Mm-hmm. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And it is and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So sin is lying at the door. Nobody is immune to this virus called sin except through Jesus Christ. Without Mm -hmm. him, we all become slaves to sin. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which is so easily ensnares us and let us run the endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God so again it is sin in whatever shape or form it can easily ensnare each and every one of us but we're encouraged to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Here we look at, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome... By him also he is brought into bondage. So again, what we're talking about is becoming enslaved in bondage of corruption, of sin, and are thus brought into the bondage of sin. But verse 18, it's interesting, verse 18 states this, and I think we can all identify with this. It states that we are lured through the lusts of the flesh, Mm -hmm. and Satan knows each and every one of our weaknesses and vulnerabilities to sin. And if we look at Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul describes how we are either slaves to sin and unrighteousness, or we're slaves to Jesus Christ and his righteousness. In Romans 6, verses 10 through 12, we read, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. So Paul is encouraging us once again to turn to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So what does this have to do with today's lesson on celebrating freedom and the Sabbath. Well, as we know, only God can free us from sin and the consequences of sin. Mm -hmm. 
It's only through his power that we can overcome and be freed and saved from sin, to be freed from the bondages and the slavery and destruction, both physically and spiritually, of sin. And God reminds us, he invites us, and he commands us weekly, as he did with ancient Israel, and he does the same with us today through Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. We won't read that right now. And Deuteronomy 5.15. And it's to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Amen. God, with his outstretched arm, by his power, by his righteousness, he invites us to celebrate the freedom which is in him on this very, very special day. The Sabbath day, as we have said, it's the only day of the week, a special day that is set aside. It's blessed and sanctified from the rest of of the week to remember who our creator is. It's a special day of reconciliation with our creator. It's a special day of communion, fellowship, and freedom with our creator. It's a special day of reflection to remember and celebrate that by faith in him that he is the one who sanctifies us and frees us from the bondage of sin. It's a special day of celebrating freedom in him and it's a special day that he gives us rest in him amen the sabbath is a special day because of our relationship with him so in closing god gives us the sabbath as a gift and as he states and we heard this before mark chapter 2 verse 27 that the sabbath was made for man and not man for the sabbath So celebrating the Sabbath is a special day because of our relationship with him. I was told this by someone uh, several years ago, and that is, it's not about a day, it's about a relationship. Well, I agree partly with that. It is about a day because of our relationship. That I think is so critical. So on this day, God provides us the freedom. I look at it as almost a furlough from the day-to-day living that that we go through. And as we know, God tells us in Isaiah 58, 13 through 14, and let me read this. It's so important for us to understand this. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Praise God. Thanks so much, Greg. So important, the concept that you've just uh, enumerated for us. You know, so many people just treat the Sabbath as an event. Mm -hmm. It is just not an event. It is a a commitment yes. to be with Christ for that day. Amen. And, and as we commit ourselves to Christ for that day, he takes us to the cross. There, right there, we pour our heart. He comes within and cleanses us. And reconciliation is part of that day. Yes. Reconstruction Amen. is part Amen. of that day. So it's so important that we understand it is a day that God set aside for us, a gift. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, on Tuesday's lesson, The Stranger in Your Gates, is powerful. It really piggybacks on uh, Greg's um, uh, really explanation of Monday's lesson. And I'm going to start by reading <clears throat> Exodus chapter 19, verses 6. Exodus 19, 6. And we read in that particular verse. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So God gives that instruction. Israelites and you and I, we need to become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, according to God's divine plan and purpose, the Israelites were to be both a royal and a priestly priestly race. In a sinful world... They were to be moral and spiritual kings. That's really what it means to be royal and prevail over the domain of sin. As priests, they were to be drawn near to the Lord in prayer, in praise, 
and in sacrifice. Israel had been called out of Egypt to be God's covenant people. They could have been the nation through whom the gospel would have been spread to the world had they stayed faithful. As a people consecrated to God's service, Israel were to be unlike any other nation. This was to be manifest outwardly by circumcision. As you, if you read chapter 17 of Genesis, this was part of the identity of God's people. And inwardly, by godliness, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9. Here's what Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, is on special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him, God's praises, who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. You see, the Israelites were the object of God's special care and concern. They were given special privileges. And at the same time, they were given special responsibilities. Being royal and priestly are significant responsibilities. As intermediaries between God and the heathen nations, they were to serve as instructors, preachers, prophets, and were to be examples of holy living, which really means being heaven's representatives of this true relation, the true religion. God expected the Israelites to, uh, to, to, to be the chosen people, to become a blessing to the heathen nations. You see... The laws God gave Israel to govern the world were to be lived and taught universally. That included the observance of the Sabbath, the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 23, verses 12, Exodus 23, 12, we read, and this is a key verse for this, this portion of, of, of our Sabbath school lesson. Six days you shall do your work says God, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of, of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. Important. The Lord cares about animals. The Lord cares about everybody. The purpose for the, the instruction we have just read in Exodus 23.12 is to provide on the Sabbath day rest and relief for the most, most burden for both all human beings and animals. The truth is God created all people. So all people should remember the Sabbath day. According to scripture, the Sabbath blessings are for all humanity. Not only Amen. for the Jews or you and I, Seventh-day Adventists. It's for all. Amen. The blessings of the Sabbath are not exclusively for the Jews. According to the Old Testament, these blessings are for every human being, including the servant and the stranger, as we read in Exodus 23.12. Or even the commandment. As the Lord clearly instructed in Exodus 20, verses 10, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 14, the servants, the strangers, and even the animals should be given a Sabbath rest. So let's read what Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 14 tells us. Be the serv uh, but the servant day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, writes Moses. And then he says, in it you, sh you shall do, not, do no work, nor you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant or your, your female servant may rest as well as you. The expectation is, if I'm resting, then everybody within my gates need to rest. See, God cares for the animals he created. In Exodus chapter 23, verses 5, chapter 23, 5, 
as part of the laws of justice and mercy given to Israel, we read, and this is profound, if you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help him with it. Help the person that hates you, you know, get that donkey relief. That's really what it says. You see, God remembers the animals in the ark. In Genesis chapter 8, verses 1, God tells us, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. He was caring for the fact that for so long they were on that ark on the water. And they now desire to be on solid ground and enjoy the fruits thereof. Amen. And so, by the way, in Genesis chapter 9, verses 9 and, 9 and 11, Genesis 9, 9, 11, and I'm not going to re read that to you, Moses tells us that these animals were included in God's covenant following the flood. This was not only for, for Noah and Noah's family, but for the animals as well. And God claims the cattle as his own. David tells us in Psalm chapter 50, verses 10, For every beast of the forest is mine, says the Lord, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, the stranger is for all purposes a foreigner, who of ease or on free will joined the Israelites, left Egypt with them, and accompanied them in their wilderness experience. Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, verses 38, Exodus 12, 38, describes it this way. A mixed multitude went up with them also, meaning with the Israelites, with flocks, with herds, and a great deal of, of livestock. These were people that had not yet chosen to partake of the covenantal promises given to Israel. Yet for as long as they chose to remain with the Israelites, they were conformed to the requirements God set for his people. And that included observing the Sabbath rest. Now, human beings, even animals, should never be exploited, abused, or Amen. taken advantage of. Amen. Every week as we meet to celebrate the Sabbath rest, we are reminded in a powerful way of just how much in, in common we have with any other, any other person. And even if we do enjoy blessings and privileges that others don't, we must remember that we are still part of the same human family, and as such we are to treat others with respect and dignity. I really want to conclude by saying the following. Though we should always keep in mind that the Sabbath represents to us uh, we should also remember what it tells us about others. You see, our commitment to rest and relate to our Creator and Redeemer, as He has instructed us to do, will drive us automatically to look at others with new eyes, to see them as being created by, by the same God as we were created, and to see them loved by the same God who loves us and who Amen. died for them just as He died for us. Amen. The Sabbath... Not only is it a day of worship, but it is also a day to bless others. Jesus performed more healing miracles on the Sabbath day than on any other day of the week. For Jesus, the Sabbath was a day to touch others uh, with his healing grace. And so the question is, what about you and I? How special and meaningful is our Sabbath day? Amen. Mary, Wednesday's lesson tells us that saving others honors God's Sabbath. That's right. We're going to continue studying that. You sort of gave me a little segue into it there at the end. Um, does service fit into the Sabbath rest equation? According to the Sabbath school lesson, we're going to look into that, serving others on the Sabbath day. Sabbath observance, as we've seen, was instituted at the beginning and re restated at Mount Sinai. By the time Jesus walked on this earth, over 1,450 years had passed between Mount Sinai and when Jesus um, began his ministry. During that great span of time, 
the religious leaders had established dozens of prohibitions and rules to keep the Sabbath holy. Do you think all those rules coincided with God's idea of Sabbath holiness? Oh, no. Let's read about an event that occurred at the Pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem involving a crippled man which occurred on the Sabbath day. John 5, verses 7 to 16. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Amen. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon Amen. you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So what was the charge brought against Jesus? Well, verse 16 says, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So what were the things Jesus did on this Sabbath occasion. He healed a man, mm -hmm. and he told the man to carry his bed, which according to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, was not lawful. So in eyes of these Jews, Jesus is a Sabbath breaker and inciting others to do likewise. Mm -hmm. John doesn't record one mention of the Jews praising God for the wonderful miracle Jesus had just performed in this man's life. Instead, they condemned Jesus and scold the man who received the blessing. Desire of Ages, page 204 says, so In their judgment, he had not only broken the law in healing the sick man on the Sabbath, but had committed sacrilege in bidding him to bear away his bed. The Jews had so perverted the law they made it a yoke of bondage, especially was the Sabbath hedged in by all manner of senseless restrictions. They were intent on maintaining their own rules, regulations, and traditions. Is there an application here for our lives? Do we need to be careful that in our own way and in our own context, we don't make similar mistakes? Mm -hmm. So how should we keep the Sabbath? Does God give us some guidelines? Greg read this earlier, but I'm going to reread Isaiah 58, 13 to 14. It's, there's so much in here, and I really want us to pay attention to this. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So this is a simple if-then statement. If these things are done, then this is the result. Mm -hmm. That's what God is telling us. So he's saying, first, turn away from doing your pleasure. Stop pursuing your own interests. Secondly, call Sabbath a delight, not a burden. Enjoy it. Celebrate it. Call it holy. Remember, it's the Lord's day. Honor the Lord 
especially on this day. Don't do your own ways, your own pleasures, or speak your own words. And lastly, if you do all those things, all these blessings listed in verse 14 will be a result. You'll delight yourself in the Lord. He will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and he will feed you with the heritage of Jacob. In the same chapter of Isaiah, verses 6 and 7, we're not going to read it here, but God is inviting us to look out for those who struggle, who are captives, who are hungry and naked and walk in darkness. Those are all literal, but they can also be metaphors for those who are spiritual captives, Amen. hungry, naked, and walking in darkness. This is God's ideal, not our human agendas. More than any other day of the week, Sabbath should take us out of ourselves and our own selfishness and cause us to think more about others and others' needs than about ourselves and our needs. Amen. In Desire of Ages, page 207, it says, And man also has a work to perform on this day. The necessities of life must be attended to. The sick must be cared for. The wants of the needy must be supplied. He will not be held guiltless who neglects to relieve suffering on the Sabbath. God's holy rest day was made for man, and acts of mercy are in perfect harmony with its intent. Amen. In conclusion, we have examples of Jesus serving others on the Sabbath, and we have scripture that clearly tells us to serve others on Sabbath. These acts of service honor God's Sabbath and are part of the Sabbath rest. We should remember to incorporate them into our Sabbath-keeping practices. And with that... I'd like to hand that on over to Greg, who's going to continue with Thursday. Amen. It's my pleasure. In fact, Thursday's lesson I love because I was born and raised Roman Catholic, and so I never understood the Sabbath. I always thought it was something for just the Jews, and we've gone through a lot of this information. But uh, Thursday's lesson is titled, The Sign mm -hmm. That We Belong to God. Amen. So, Let's read Exodus chapter 31, and we're going to go through verse 13 and 16 and 17. And we begin. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you and throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, Amen. and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Amen. So let's unpack this a little bit. Let me ask you this. What is the Sabbath a sign of? What do these verses tell us? Mm -hmm. The Sabbath is a sign to us that God is our creator mm -hmm. and a sign to him that we are his. And verse 13 that we just read tells us that the Sabbath is a sign between God and each of us, that it reminds us that he is the Lord, our creator, who sanctifies us. And verse 16, as we read, it tells us that we shall observe it as a perpetual covenant between God and us, and that it is a sign forever. And we're going to unpack that too in just a moment. Think about it. It's part of the Ten Commandments. It's not part of the Mosaic law that was temporary, the Mosaic sacrificial law that was nailed to the cross. God's commandments stand for eternity. And verse 17 tells us that the Sabbath is a sign. It's a marker between God and his people forever. Then God states his authority as creator, just as he stated in the Ten Commandments of Exodus 20. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he was refreshed. He rested and was refreshed. The word sign in the Hebrew is oath, and it means a mark or evidence. So the Sabbath is God's mark or his evidence 
of his authority as our creator, Amen. and it serves as evidence to him that we acknowledge him as our creator, the authority in our lives, that he is the one who sanctifies us. And as we all know, someday, coming soon, God's sign of authority versus Satan's mark of authority will be challenged to all the world as to who we acknowledge as the authority in our lives. The term forever in Hebrew is olam. And depending upon the context, this is really important because you could read a lot about the Mosaic Law and the sacrificial system that something may last forever. Keep in mind, if it's part of the Mosaic Law, it was temporary, meaning that it would be kept for a long time. And that's what it can mean. It can mean for a long time, a long duration. But also, depending upon the context, it can mean forever, everlasting, evermore, eternity. So in this context, God is repeating what he stated in the fourth commandment, right. which is everlasting. And further proof of this, that the Sabbath is everlasting, is that God tells us that we'll celebrate the Sabbath in heaven and in the new earth. And Victor read this earlier, but I'm going to read it again, mm -hmm. so that that way we can really remember this. Mm -hmm. And that is Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall pass, it will come to pass, that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Amen. So we know that the Sabbath will be kept for eternity. But let's just step back for one moment. Let's read Genesis 2, 3. We've already read that. Let's read it again. Genesis 2, 3 <clears throat> says, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. And Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, we don't need to read each of those verses. But the last part in verse 11, God states, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. <clears throat> so every week, God's, by God's authority, he reminds us and he also provides us, both humans and creatures alike, as Victor had mentioned in Tuesday's lesson, the freedom and the furlough that he gives us from day-to-day -day work and the toils of this world, and to join him in commemoration as him being our creator, because he created us, he sanctifies us, he invites us to fellowship with him, and in doing so, he will give us rest in him. And that rest has been given freely in Christ Jesus. Amen. And the Apostle Paul states in Hebrews 12 2, again, we read this earlier, I'm going to read it again, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So just as God had reached out to ancient Israel, an outstretched arm is reaching out to us, spiritual Israel, God's people, to join him in fellowship, to rest in him, and to remember that he is the one who frees us from sin, that he is the one who restores us, that he is the one who sanctifies us. Amen. He, Amen. God, Jesus Amen. Christ, wants a personal relationship with you and me each and every day of the week. But in particular, he set aside one day of the week, one day of the week, by his authority as creator, and that one day is the seventh day, to be a special day. So in closing, the Sabbath is God's sign. It is his evidence. It is his oath to us that he is our creator. Mm -hmm. And keeping the Sabbath is our proof. It's our evidence to God that we are his that we recognize him as our creator and redeemer, that he is the one who sanctifies us, that 
it is he and his authority in his life that is who we recognize and that we are his so my question to you is don't you need or wouldn't you like to have a break in your life from the weekly grind from all the weekly toils and challenges of this world with what's going on with pandemics don't you want a break from this don't you want peace in your life don't you want to enter into his rest as our creator then I urge you I think we all urge and encourage you to accept the invitation from our creator and to join him in celebrating this special day the Sabbath amen amen thank you so much Greg so much so much that we can really really uh, hold on to a sign sign of loyalty sign of faith amen. sign of trust sign of conviction amen. a sign of uh, so much I want to thank you Mary I want to thank you Greg so much for the contribution that you've provided to this Sabbath school lesson uh, I, I want to um, I, I want to bring the Sabbath school lesson to a close with some final thoughts uh, and maybe um, an appeal. I'm going to to ask that we put on, on on the screen Isaiah chapter 58 verses 13 and 14. Um, Greg, you you read it. Mary, you read it and explained it, and I think it's so profound for this week's lesson. I wanted us to really put that. I'm I'm going to just make one little reference to, uh, to that verse. Uh, I thought Mary did a, a great explanation. And that is the very first statement on that particular verse. You know, the verse begins by saying, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath. You see, in biblical times, placing your foot on a piece of property was a symbol of ownership. The Sabbath belongs to God, and what God is really saying to you and to me today is, it is not your day, Victor. You are not in control of that day. I'm in control of that day. That day is mine. You don't own it. But I want you to be part of me, and part of that extension of me on that day, and be privileged by really having that day for you, my day for you the way I want you to have it. Amen. Profound. You see, we don't own the Sabbath. So we graciously, God graciously invites us to find our deepest delight and highest pleasure in worshiping Him and blessing others on the Sabbath. In those verses, those verses find, found in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 13 and 14, God clearly indicates that the work of restoration can be achieved. Sabbath is established for restoration. Amen. You see, through a renewed understanding of the Sabbath and the desire to keep holy the day God set apart for communion with Him and remembrance of His work as a creator, that's why it is restoration and renewal. See, God is honored when believers engage in activities that lead them to a more deeply understanding of Him and reflect His love to others. If you remember, for me to enter a, re a perpetual and eternal relationship with God, I've got to love, love Him with all my heart, soul, and mind, and power, and my fellow man as myself. We've got to love our fellow man. The Sabbath was never intended to be an end in itself, but rather a means by which human beings might become acquainted with the character and purpose of our Creator God. On the Sabbath day, God's people are called to set aside their com common secular pursuit, activities, and yes, entertainments, and instead... Worship God and extend acts of kindness which will glorify Him and bring joy both to ourselves and to those we get in contact with. I want to end with a statement by Ellen G. White. By the way, we all referred to the desire of ages in pages 207. It's a very good 
piece of literature for you to actually read and study. And here's the quote on page 207 of, of the Desire of Ages that I want to leave you with. It says, the Sabbath is not intended to be a period of useless inactivity. The law forbids secular labor, labor on the rest day of the Lord. The toil that gains a livelihood must cease. No labor for worldly pleasure or profit is lawful upon that day. But as God seized his labor of creating and rested upon the Sabbath and blessed it, so man is to leave the occupations of his daily life and devote those sacred hours to healthful rest, to worship, to holy deeds. The work of Christ in healing the sick was a perfect accord with the law, and it honored the Sabbath. Amen. Amen. I, just, I just hope that as we consider this lesson today, that we can really say to ourselves, is my Sabbath, or the observance of my Sabbath, in line with God's will? Amen. Amen. Let's, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your amazing grace. Amen. Lord, what an incredible God you are. That you created us. You created the world. You gave us an opportunity, Lord, to really care for your creation. And then, Lord, you set a day, a 24-hour day for us to have a special communion with you that day. And then, Lord, to glorify you by loving you with all our heart, by being in, in a relationship with you, but reaching out to others and share the love that you have for mankind. Help us to achieve that, O oh Lord. I want to thank you, Father, not only for your blessings, but I want to thank you also for your redeeming power. And I want to thank you, Father, that you will be here soon to Amen. take us home Amen. so that we can enjoy perpetuity, a perpetual life with you. And Lord, yes, observing every seventh day Sabbath with you in a very special way Amen. in the new Jerusalem. Thank you, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.